and that's the most beautiful thing about theosis. You start to share your created nature with the creator's nature. You never become his essence. You always become the human version of that divinity. But I want to give you this experience so, so you can notice, do you throw it out there with your mind or is it in yourself? And for that, we can help. We can ask for the Holy Spirit's help. We can ask for the Father's help so that you can identify this. Again, it's very subtle. It's very, 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 very gentle. You know, you're holding this one-day-old little creature and, and you're not holding and comforting and, and crushing it in so it's got no room to live. You're holding it in such a way that you can observe how it works. How is it? What is it? But with theosis, with the theosis mindedness, you're not at all interested in projecting an image of it. You want to be tasting it as you yourself are tasting yourself like that. It's the inner self-awareness, self-enlightening uh, gift of God that gives us a Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I want you to, to lift up your people now, your individual persons, Lord, lift each person up in the mindedness of theosis. And here we're wanting to recognize the imitation of Christ in thought, word and deed as far as is possible for human beings, believing rightly and blamelessly in the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son whose fusion you're going to have by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lift them up into this mind. And for this, the Father is saying to me, consider that you are now deceased. You now no longer have a body, but you are present and you have a mindedness in yourself. And in yourself, there is no need of memory of other people, there's no need of memory of your life on earth or calculating your life on earth. You have not yet stepped into your eternal destiny in heaven. This, you're just there. You're just starting out. And now he says, now observe, I, God, come into, your, into you. And notice this. Thank you, Father. And you'll notice the move of God comes into you. God himself comes into your consciousness and makes himself present. Amen. Put your hand up if you just noticed that happened to you. This is God's instruction. This is what God's doing. Yeah, amen. And so now you will be aware of you and God. So if you want consultation, you can now speak with God inside of you. And you have got God's, you've got only God's mindedness to communicate with you. There's no clutter, there's no superstition, there's no memories, there's no invasion of your consciousness. There's just your consciousness and the Father's consciousness inside of you. And you can have dialogue should you want to. But now let's think of something a little bit more intimate than that, and that is what's the union of you and God like in the theosis mindedness what's that union like and the way to do that is again we ask the father to change the consciousness inside so that the theosis mindedness the union of it is present but in such a way that you know it not you're observing it and if your mind jumps out like this Pull it back. You cut it off. Say, no, I don't want that version. Heavenly Father, release the person's mindedness now so that the theosis mind, the perfect fusion mindedness that Jesus himself had with you, that mindedness is in each of your children now. And those watching here, on, on listening to this or watching on camera, the same thing. Father, do that now.
Now put your hand up if you think that you've just become extraordinarily yourself, just you, just normal, just like it seems like there's just me, but it's plus plus. This is the fusion mindedness. Now it can take a person years to come to this and it can take a person then another period of time to be able to work this into the daily life. And the difficulty of working it into the daily life is maintaining the purity of heart so that we know that this is what's going on in our life. It's very easy. Like if I get on the chainsaw, I am not there thinking about my theosis reality with the father of all creation. You know, I'm busy trying to keep the, the, the chain away from cutting my legs off and making sure that it's sharp enough to get through the wood and, and making sure my, I've got some goggles on so I'm not blinded by the chips spitting back at me. You know, like imitating Christ in thought, word and deed is just not there for me. And so there are times where you're involved in your human life and this is really valuable to know. There are times when you are involved in your human life that is purely you, but you're still in your theosis. But your humanness is predominant. Now, uh, Father, bring to mind some activity that each of your children do where they are exactly like that. They're in theosis, but they themselves are predominant. It'll probably be ugly. Go on, put your hand up. There you go. It doesn't mean you've fallen from sainthood. What it means invariably is that you are simply using a more material aspect of your life to get something done. And if you didn't do it, it's not going to happen around you. You've got to, you know, if you're driving down the road, for example, you, you've got to be able to be material enough in your mindedness to be able to get the vehicle around the curves and over the bridges and so forth. You need that. And so it's the, the, the pathway of theosis is valuable to know about Jesus Christ that Jesus was able to do things in a purely material way and he was able to do things in an absolute godly way as the Son of God and he was able to do things as a fusion between the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit power is always available always available and the mindedness that you find is that are you doing it for yourself are you doing it for someone else? You know, are you serving? Or are you simply looking after your own, you know, are you chopping your own firewood, for example? You know, are you, are you clearing your own snow away from the driveway sort of thing? Are you cleaning up your dishes? Are you making your own bed? Are you cutting your own lunch? You know, these things that are the ordinary part of life, it's valuable, very, very valuable to know that this too is the imitation of Christ. And the pure heartedness that's in, within you can stop at any moment and turn to God and worship God, can turn to God and praise God, not because God has demanded it upon you, but because you're just suddenly mindful of some aspect of God or something God's done for you. We've just had Ron put in two skylights in our kitchen. You wouldn't believe how lit up the tomb of the kitchen has become. It's brilliant. You, know, you walk in there and you, the first thing I walk to do is to turn the lights off. Well, the lights aren't even on any longer. It's just, it's full of light. There are things that you do every day that you look at that and you think, glory to God, and you just praise God because the pure heartedness of the mind of Christ inside of you is every second ready to do that. Well, if you're in the middle of chainsawing, it's probably going to take more than a couple of seconds to do that. You know, you're probably at least going to take the chainsaw, the blade out of the, out of the piece of 
Lent before you praise God. But your prayed-upness is a part of your knowing who Christ is so that you're imitating Christ. So the great thing about reading the, the, the Gospels, for example, and, and the non-Gospels are people's individual experience of Christ. Well, that's it's valuable to read those, but remember that that's just that person's experience of Christ. If you come back into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you hear the words of Jesus, Jesus himself will feed you into his heart of hearts, and you'll come to know what Jesus' reality was at that moment in Scripture. But then he also gives you the wisdom to do some reverse engineering and work out, well, how did he come to be able to be like that? And that's the pathway that you want. You want, because he's charitable, what experiences did he have that enabled that charitability as a human being? As God, he's just, boom, 100% charitable. So what? No, it's just who I am. I'm God, I give, boom. But as a human being, in the struggle of give and take, and in the struggle of learning your own identity and developing your own value systems. You know, Jesus had value systems different from his brothers and sisters, different from his mom, his dad, his, and, and their brothers and sisters, you know, his uncles and aunts and all his cousins. He had his own value system as they did. So if you can reverse engineer with Jesus, how did you get that, Lord? And if you don't know, you just say to him, Lord, show me how you develop your theosis with, with the Father. I've done that so many times, Father. Jesus, show me how, how it was for you. And straight away, there'll be something happen for me. Like instant. It's the, it's the paramount question that God wants to hear from you. It's better than how do I heal the sick? How do I raise the dead? It's far better. How do I function in the fullness of our fusion together, Father? That's the top question that God's waiting to hear from you. And straight away, you'll get a response, you'll get a move of something in the world that gives you that answer for you. So let's have a look at this. Imitation of Christ in thought, word, and deed. Firstly, you've recognized that in yourself, you have got the capacity by God's uncreated gift. It stays in the eternal. It's built of the eternal. And it comes into you and makes an eternal portion of you by its presence with you. And so soul is created out of eternal fabric. It's, it's, it's written in eternity. If you think about somebody, let's do this. Think about somebody in your past right now. Uh, ten years ago, think of how old you are now. Think back ten years. Where were you ten years ago? What's it, 2022? I'd be go back 2012. Where were you in 2012? And let one person come to mind who impacted you, who, whose life you impacted. Now think of what you did with that person concerning God or what, how that person interacted with you concerning God. And you'll probably even remember the words you said to that person. The thing I want you to notice is how it's written in eternity language. It's not just a thought. The substance of it is made out of this eternity. It's, it's pristine. It's there like it's always been there. And much isn't. You know, how many, how many good pizzas can you remember eating? You know, probably like five. And you've eaten dozens. You know. How many countries have you been to? And, you know, and, and, and like, what are, the, what are the bright sparks of all those countries? You'll probably think of like, oh, maybe a handful of things at best. And yet you've, you've flooded yourself with those experiences. But when we think of the gift of God coming into you, it's very, very valuable to recognize that the knowing of God is happening inside your being. You're, you're knowing God with your being 
and God gives you an uncreated gift to know him and the uncreated gift makes and it creates, it builds in its own uncreate language. That makes you a living eternity in those experiences. And that knowing is the same knowing that Christ walked with. And, and when, we, when we will know Christ from this kind of knowing, we get a direct rapport and communication and empathy with Jesus Christ himself. And we get to know how he spoke, how he thought, how he did things, because he imparts to us at uncreate level, not just at thought level, but uncreate level, our discernment that says, glory to God, I love, and you love it. You know, you, you, it just fills you with life. You've got life of God in the very knowing of that stuff. And if somebody then asks you, can you speak about it? You've then got a major problem on hand because you've got to turn the uncreate into some sort of fabricated dream stuff called words and descriptions. And, and you know, you're, you're trying to point them at something inside themselves through words, which can't really do that all that well. You're wanting the person's own experience of the uncreate to actually self-reveal within themselves. Let's have a look at the next page of this. I hope you put your hand up if this is working for you. I'm, I'm uh, good, good. It's the study of your own being and, and, and how it's relating to God infusing you is literally the, the thing that John Climacus is talking about. This is, and this is where he's coming from. This position is where he's coming from. The lover of God is whoever lives in communion with all that is natural and sinless, and as far as he or she is able, neglects nothing good. You can notice that about your being. You notice that about this fusion being, this theosis being that you are with God. When God fills it, let's, let's have a look at that and give an example of this one here. Father, I want you to separate yourself from your person's mindedness right now. And let them be just purely material when they get caught up in something that is not particularly good. Just let them have a mindedness, have an have a awareness of that, and then we'll come in and, and make an adjustment in that. Now, Heavenly Father, come into your child right now, into, your, into the pure-heartedness of your child, and let them notice how it changes to good, how it becomes a whole other substance as soon as you come in, and how there is a revulsion of that in themselves. And, and I'm not wanting to, to, to continue that sort of action in their life. And I want you to notice that when God is in you in this theosis mindedness, the mindedness of God is your natural way of being. As, as we were doing liturgy this morning with Matthew the Poor from one of his texts, I've turned some of that into liturgy and we sing it here. And one of the things that he, he writes about is that by God's action inside of us, we are returned to our natural sinless self. Now, this is a really good thing to notice because you can hear preachers preaching about sin as if they've never actually returned back to their natural, the naturalness of their self. The naturalness of yourself is not actually looking to find sin in anything. It's naturally good. And it looks to the naturally good in other things. It just that's its way of conducting itself. It's not splitting itself like this. And so I remember going into churches, um, several places around the world, and and feeling like I wanted to walk out after ten minutes of the preaching because it was divisively stuck in 
preaching against sin with no reference whatsoever to the naturalness of the fusion mindedness that just doesn't even bother with that. It's just not there. And so it's, it's valuable to notice that in the pure heart of God, you have overcome sin. You have overcome the grip of sin. Now, this is an important thing. Thank you, Father, for reminding me. It's, it's valuable to know that you can have in your life, and you will have had this already, you will have had experiences in your life that will have given you preference over the things of the world versus the things of God. And many of those things will have required you to, to be, be, in a sense, um, torn down by sin. It will tear you away from the Father. I remember wanting to have robes and, and on, on the robes put, put a red cloth like this with shredded cloth at the bottom, thinking that as you ascend the ladder of the divine uh, ascent, that that which is evil and that which is against God is clawing at you and basically shredding you until you've outgrown it enough where it can no longer actually put its meat hooks into you. Now, this is really valuable to know because when you come into the Father fusion mindedness of God, you'll find that sin can't grab a hold of you. It's like you are a glass mountain with no, no crevices that you can put anything into. You know, it's just... It's just sheer, and and the the sinless mindedness of God is like this. It's it's really valuable to know that that you can outgrow a demonic, a satanic attempt at dragging you down and separating you from God. You you can outgrow that. It's fairly easy once you start climbing the ladder of divine ascent to outgrow that. Uh, much that that John Climacus will speak about right up to the final stage, you know, the 30th step there, is, is the capacity for iniquity to actually trick you and pull you away from God. That's, that's what this icon that we've just got is showing, that even you know, up to the three steps from the top, there's still some poor fellow who's been pulled off the ladder. But if you've got, if you base yourself in the pure-heartedness the experience of the pure heartedness of the Father in you in an uncreate manner, not as a thing, not as a living object, but as substance within you, the, the Father influencing your own substance, then you find that you are able to live in this sinlessness and it is good. And it seeks to produce after its own kind. That's the value of it. The goodness of God in you seeks to produce good decisions and produce good fruit. And that fruit always comes back to you. And the goodness of God always comes back to you from the seed that you've sown. And God is generous. God throws out a few good seeds first of all to make sure there's something coming back to you. And it's like, you know, you've, it's like your credit card. <laughs> you've, been, you've been given a bit of credit. And as you build on that, it comes back to you. I'll, I'll give an example of that so that you, you know, we're anchoring you in this, in this overcoming of sin naturally. Heavenly Father, I want you to bring to mind inside of your child right now an experience where the goodness of this theosis mind inside of them, the goodness of God, has done something. And then, uh, Father, I want you to show the returning fruit in their life because of that thing that they did. so that they can recognize the cause and the effect. Now I'm going to speak into that and say that 
the cause is invariably you doing something as a servant. You're, you're doing something that's uplifting, that's, that's giving life somewhere to someone. And the effect of that is that not only do you get a goodness come back to you, but actually you find that God is present in the source that's returning the effect to you. And in this way, orphanhood is completely obliterated. It doesn't exist. You've got the presence of God going out from you and the presence of God coming back to you. And your life then is going from glory to glory to glory, from blessing to blessing to blessing. In other words, in the, in the terms of Jesus' Beatitudes, you are living in an eternal Beatitude system where what you do is always going to create God returning it to you, and that return is going to be uh, different in more complicated situations. And the more complicated situation that you're facing and dealing with, the greater is the return of God to uplift you because the blessing is uncreate. It creates your soul and expands your soul, expands your uncreate consciousness, your eternity consciousness. And this is the theosis journey. The, the unseen soul, as it was, is being fed by the effects that you yourself sow. It's the most beautiful system. And you can't you can't uh, you can't outgive God. You can't you can't you know if the and this is the thing. I'd like you to try it this week. Come across a situation where you are prompted to give something, and it might be the last thing you've got, or it might be your special thing. You know, the thing you're holding on. And if you weigh it up and you think, oh, you gee, if I do this, this might happen to me, and oh, good things are going. If you weigh it up like that, you'll just bog yourself down in in a swamp. Just give it, and you'll notice the return come. And if you and you can even ask the Father and say, Father, if I give this, what's the return? Show me the return. And God will prophetically do that. God will show you the return. And so in your theosis mindedness, the gift of God's prophet, prophetic communication to you is there all the way, going out and coming back to you. Just recognize that, and you'll start to recognize the power of this mind that John Clematis is talking about here. The lover of God is whoever lives in communion with all that is natural and sinless, and as far as he or she is able, neglects nothing good. I'll just read off the last part. We've come to our time here, but I'll read off. The continent person is whoever is in the midst of all temptations, snares, and turmoil, and strives with all their might to imitate the ways of him who is free from such. Are you imitating Jesus who is free from such? I remember somebody once said that Jesus was never in a hurry, and sometimes I'm thinking about the way that I do things, some of it's never in a hurry, but a great deal of it is seriously pressured. It's time pressured, it's fact pressured, you know, you're, you're holding, you're spinning too many cups all at once, too many plates all at once, rather. How is that for you? This, this is how to think about this, because we won't come back to this, we'll, we'll move on through it. The, the monk or the nun is whoever within their earthly life, uh, earthly and soiled body, rather, toils toward the rank and state of incorporeal beings. In other words, you're thinking like the angels. There's a, there's a measure of theosis that you come to after you know how to do the will of God and you're practicing the doing of the will of God in your life. There's a measure of heaven that opens up that now starts to enculturate you as if you are totally incorporeal, that you are disembodied. You are now walking with the angels in heaven. And this heavenly input comes into you and it comes in as values it comes in as don't choose this choose that and don't do it like this do it like that it comes in very literally like that it's a whole other kind of heavenly energy that comes upon you 
out of God. You know, God, what God gives us is always energy. God gives us this heavenly energy that lifts us up in that way. And and so it's quite true. You you start to want to live toward that incorporeal uh, way of living. The monk or nun, and remember he's writing to monks. I've actually inserted the word nun so as to be gender inclusive. But a monk or nun strictly controls their nature and unceasingly watches over their senses. Why? Because they want this theosis mindedness, the pure hearted naturalness of God, not to be asleep, not to be dormant, not to be passive, not to be some nirvana that doesn't pay attention to anything, but to be the most sensitive organ in their entire being, that they can have that and pour it out in their life. A monk or nun is one who keeps their body in chastity, their mouth pure, and their mind illumined. I must admit, I've still got a really foul mouth from times, uh, time to time, and, and it comes from my youth. And I, I really should discipline myself about it, but there's so few people around here that I don't care, and so why would they care? You know, Irene picks me up on it every now and again because she's a pure-hearted soul. But we've all got our, probably all got something that we can keep improving on. And I, I have improved on it immensely since being here. Um, it used to be fairly, you know, I was a sailor, what can you ask for? A monk or a nun is a morning soul that both asleep and awake is unceasingly occupied with the remembrance of death. We were talking about that the other day. This is something you might like to think of too. If death terrifies you, get over it. Let your death be present. Let your, on oh, it. this is, that's it, gone, finished. Halfway through drinking your tea, gone. You know, you're busy preparing a meal for somebody. It's so important, how important, not gone. <laughs> it puts everything in perspective. You know, it really does. You're presenting your best thing to somebody. Whoop, gone. And suddenly you realize, oh yeah, my life is eternal. And it helps you to have this interior heart of God that is patient. I remember when that first started to happen for me, I would drop something and I wouldn't care. I would break something and I wouldn't care. I'd tip something over and I wouldn't care. There was no panic in rescuing my life any longer. God's life is just proceeding quite normally. Withdrawal from the world is voluntary hatred of vaunted material things and denial of nature for the attainment of what is above nature. So you can see how he's talking about this very heart that is filled with the uncreate giftings of the Father that enable it to imitate Christ's uncreate mindedness with the Father as well. Now let's leave it at that and we'll pick it up next week with the next thing that um, John Climacus is leading us to. I know you've been blessed, I've been blessed. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Love you very much indeed. Thank you for coming.